All right, so welcome to MathStat 341 Probability. This is the second lecture. And you know, as I was remarking earlier, all of the lectures will be online as well as previous iterations of the course. So you can actually decide if you are really bored, which version of the lecture do you prefer? What I want to do this week is a little bit of an experiment. So today I want to just do a straight lecture, essentially what I did God knows how many times in the past. What I want to do on Wednesday is just assign you the lecture to watch, and I'm not going to do any of that material in the class at all, unless you ask me questions on it. I'm going to turn it into just a general open review day. You can ask questions on anything. You can look at any of the problems in the book, any concepts from this or other classes that you want to talk about, and we can talk about it. We can either do it uh, by you asking the questions live, or you can email me in advance and say, hey, Professor Miller, could you talk about X? My first year here, I was teaching differential equations in the spring, and linear algebra is not a prerequisite, or at least was not at the time, which is very painful. It's tough to do a class like differential equations when you don't have linear algebra, because it makes it hard to do systems of equations. So there's several solutions. One is to just not do them. The other is to say, to hell with this, you know, let's just do a simple two variable, two systems, and I'll just make sure everybody understands the basic linear algebra we need. And so I asked the class, is everybody comfortable with two by two matrices or do people want to review? Anybody want to hazard how many people asked for a review? Yeah, zero. And I said, are you sure? I'm happy to do a review. Does anybody want to review? Everyone's comfortable. No one wants to review. Okay. We had clickers. And I said, using the clickers, write one if you want to review, two if you don't want to review. I will not report this back to the class. I'm just curious for my own 43 or 47%, I forget which. I never said I wouldn't tell other classes. I just said I wouldn't tell their class. So if you are thinking, oh, I'm the only one who doesn't understand this. I'm the only one who wants this to be reviewed. It's possible, but I would be shocked if that was the case. 43% wanted a review, but didn't want to say anything. You know, I was younger and more terrifying back then. You know, the mask didn't hide, you know, hit, it wasn't there to hide the horrible mean expressions. So if there's something you want to see, let's do it. And then for Friday, I thought I would do a little bit of a mix is have you watch the video beforehand and then basically follow that a little bit and then just go off from that on points you found difficult, points you found challenging, points you found interesting. Okay, so I will email all of this again. All right, so what I want to do now is we want to the next slide. Okay, so the plan for today, and you know, again, my handwritten notes from the time you before Zoom, you know, is available online. And I'll try to keep all the links on the slides there to just make it as easy as possible. Is I want to review factorials, binomials, the choosing functions, stuff like that. I then want to talk about one of my favorite problems, the birthday problem. It's a nice way to use some calculus results. And it's a nice way to emphasize that for many problems, we don't have to solve things exactly. We just have to be close. There's also some interesting challenges. Just because I can write down a formula for something does not mean I understand how to find the answer. One of my favorite examples is Feynman reduced all of physics to one equation, u equals zero. And the way u is defined is you take every equation in physics and you subtract the left-hand side from the right-hand side and square. So since everything is real value, well, if you want to take absolute values. So the only way it can be satisfied is if each individual equation is true. So writing the equation u equals zero really doesn't help you understand what's going on. It writes it in very compact notation, but it's not going to be very useful. And so just because we can write down formulas to solve things doesn't necessarily mean we can solve things in reasonable amounts of time. The first time I taught a class like this, I was moving from Ohio State to Brown, and I hadn't um, you know, arrived at Brown yet, so I went to the library to pull out a you know, copy of the book that I was going to use at Brown. And I wasn't able to get the current edition, but I think it doesn't really matter. And so there was a problem involving a combinatorial question involving a binomial coefficient. And you know, the book says, yeah, at this point, once you write down that the answer is this binomial coefficient, you might think you've solved the problem. And I'm going, well, the reason I think that is because I have solved the problem. Here's the answer. And then the book goes on, but we haven't solved the problem yet. Go, what do you mean it's? And the book goes, but you still have to compute this. Go, well, how old is this book? Oh my, this book was before good calculators and computers. And so back then the factorials were so large that it was a non-trivial problem to actually calculate it. 
Now, with the computers we have nowadays, a lot of this is not a problem for the standard stuff, but as you push things further to the boundary, it becomes a challenge to calculate some of these things in real time. And we will see that very soon. So I will talk a little bit later today about you know, QWERTY, Babylonian mathematics, and you know, stuff like that in terms of how we can try to do calculations well. And that is going to be one of the themes of this class is to try to compute things in a reasonable amount of time. So again, there's a difference between a formula and a useful formula. And then the other thing, and this is related to uh, QWERTY, is things get institutionalized. So think very hard on notation. Think very hard before you start doing something. Spend a little bit of time exploring and think, is this the best way to go before you spend you know, hours looking at something? You know, do a little preliminary investigation. All right, does anybody know the birthday problem? All right, what is the birthday problem? If you have a room with n people, what's the probability that two or more people will share the same birthday? Okay. Um, so I'll do how many so have a 50% chance. It's a slight version at least to share a birthday. So yours is a little bit more general because you know you're saying just I want to know what the probability is that at least two share a birthday. Is everybody happy with this as the statement of the birthday problem? So what are the assumptions? That uh, on any given person has a random chance of having, like every day has an equally random chance okay. of being on a birthday. All B days are equally likely. Yes. All independent. So, I am married to an identical twin. One of my friends in graduate school was an identical twin. When they go to family gathering, the probability of two people sharing a birthday is quite high. There is one other thing that we really want to assume. It's kind of implicit in all birthdays are equally likely. I have a deal with the registrar and admissions. No one is supposed to be allowed to come to Williams College and take my class if their birthday is I'm sorry? Yes. So I assume nobody here was born on February 29th, correct? Well, that, that, that's okay. It's, it's okay that your father was born on February 29th, which means it'll be interesting as to at what point are you older than your father. But um, why is February 29th such a bad day? Well, if we want all the birthdays to be equally likely, your know, February 29th only occurs approximately once out of every four years. If you want to know exactly how often you have to read all of the strange rules about every four years, but then every 200, you do this and everything. So we'll just assume no February 29th. All independent is extremely important. Do you believe birthdays are independent? Why not? And let's try to keep this, you know, because this is going to be posted on YouTube without any warnings for children. So if you can phrase it delicately. Yes. Good, good. There are certain types of year where there might be certain activities going on. There is the talk about the Super Bowl bump in terms of uh, the city that wins the Super Bowl. About nine months later, there's a little bit more birthdays than normally would be expected. Any sports players here? Do you believe birthdays are uniformly distributed on your sports teams? No. There's a great passage in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, uh, I think it's Outliers, where he talks about this. And what he does is he takes the names of the players in the Canadian Junior Hockey League Championship game and he places it with their birthday. And you see essentially all of the players are born in the first three months of the year. And the reason is you want to be the oldest kid possible to just miss the cutoff to be league eligible to play because you want to be playing against the younger people so you look better, so the coaches give you more playing time. And then because you're doing better, you get extra training. And it really, really piles up. So in terms of all of the talks about you know, different types of bias, implicit and explicit, here is a great example of something that's essentially been institutionalized. 
because we have these discrete cutoffs and it's not, well, you're going to spend 60% of your time in this league and 40% of your time in that league. No, you're either in this league or not. Such a small decision like this has profound consequences in terms of which people end up having chances. Now, this doesn't mean that somebody born you know, six months after the optimal can't make it. Uh, one of my brother-in-laws actually played soccer in high school with uh, Howard, one of the you know, famous US goalies. Although play might be not quite the right word. One of them might have been on the bench more often than the other. Doesn't matter necessarily when you're born, if you have a tremendous amount of talent, but it does make th some things a little bit easier. So things to really think about as you're making decisions, what are the unintended consequences? And when you have leagues like this, it does have consequences that propagate for years. All right, so we want to calculate the probability. And so I'm trying to just, you know, figure out what is the way to do it to maximize the amount of screen space that is going to be used. So let's let Pn be the probability that n people, now we have to calculate, do we want them to share or not to share with them? Which do you think is easier? Don't share, Don't share a birthday. That n people do not share a birthday. If you can calculate the probability that something doesn't happen, it is not hard to calculate the probability that something does happen. You know, they're just complementary events, so they're sum to one. Okay, so we'll calculate PN. So let's calculate it. So when the first person arrives, what's the probability when the first person arrives that they don't share a birthday with anyone? One. Now, there's a lot of different ways we can write one. Anybody know a really good way to write one? So one is to write it as 365 over 360. So I can write it as one. I could write it as 365 over 365, or even better, 365 minus zero over 365. So a lot of mathematics is about adding one, I'm sorry, adding zero and multiplying by one. Yes. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to write. So this, this is the beginning. So yes, if, if I, so now the second person comes in. And when the second person comes in, I want them to have a different birthday. So how many possibilities do we have for them? 365 minus one over 365. 365 minus one over 365. And we continue this and we continue it all the way to what? 365 minus, minus n minus one over 365. So I can write this um, as you know, a product, k goes from one to n minus one. So this is very similar to a sum, you know, the sum notation means add them all up, product notation means multiply them. And I can write it as one minus k over 365. Now I could write this as 365 factorial over 365 minus n factorial 365 to the n. If I try to do this, if I put in 365 factorial onto my calculator, it would not be happening. And so this is a calculation where it's extremely important how you do it. I can't just do the numerator and the denominators. I have to be a little bit clever. Well, each one of these is a number between zero and one. Multiplying them all together is not so bad, but multiplying it like this is going to just overflow things. So we need to be a little cognizant about how we're doing the calculations. All right, so I want to understand this product and I want to find, you know, let's call it n star such that P of n star equals one half. So I want to solve, you know, the product k equals one to n minus one of one minus k over 365 equals one half. This is not a pleasant equation to solve. Now, one way to do it is just by, you know, I take my calculator and I keep multiplying until I get to approximately one half. Does anybody have any idea, and if you've read the book, you might have an idea of what I should do when I see a product. You take the log, you and, can. Then, and then you get a sum of k, and 
and then you can expand that as like with the n times n plus one over two. Yes. And then you get an equation which you solve in Kevin using two inverse functions. Yes. So if you learn nothing from taking a class with me, please learn that it is almost always a good idea when you see a product to take a log of it. If you have been asked to go into an elementary school and help kids who are struggling with multiplication and say, okay, we want to multiply three and four. So we take the log of three and the log of four and we add them. And then we exponentiate and we recover 12. Okay, that's one of the few times it's bad. When you are doing things in mathematics, if you see a product, it is a really good idea to consider taking a log of So let's see what happens if we do that. So we get the log. Oops. The log of one half is the log of the product k equals one to n minus one of one minus k over 365. And so that's going to be the sum k equals one to n minus one, the log of one minus k over 365. I am assuming everybody has seen logarithms in high school. When you saw logarithms, did people ever tell you why we give a shit about logarithms? Or did the teachers just say, this is one of the units in the class, so today we're going to cover logarithms and properties of logarithms. So one of the things I want you to get out of this class is why we care so much about logarithms. So we'll see it again when we get to regression and you know, the best fit line. I might actually just give you know, a brief, maybe you know, 15 minute talk at some point in the semester on just why we like logarithms. You know, one of the big reasons is we can compare things across many orders of magnitude. You, know, you can compare something the size of a quark to the size of a galaxy in the same conversation. So the log of a product is the sum of the logs. And now the way we're going to figure this out is we believe k is not going to range over too many numbers, but n is not going to be too large. And if you think about it, you know, we know it has to be at most 366. Because once you have 366 people, there's only 365 days. Two people have to share a birthday. Imagine K was 180-ish, and that you hadn't seen two people share a birthday. Well, when the next person comes in, they have almost a 50% chance that they share a birthday with someone. And when the next person comes in, it's still almost a 50% chance. And the next, it's still almost a 50%. So if you're around 180, when you have three or four people come in, that's a you know one in eight, one in sixteen that it hasn't, that it's still not working. So we expect n is going to be much much smaller than three sixty five. So we expect n is much smaller than three sixty five. So one minus k over three sixty five is approximately one. Now, if I replace it with exactly one, the log of one is zero, and you know that's not good enough. So what I want to do is I want to approximate it with something a little bit better. And so we use Taylor series. And so this is one of the few moments where we actually are going to use something for multivariate calculus. So we use, you know, the Taylor series of F at X is going to be uh, the sum M goes from zero to infinity, the the nth derivative of our function at zero over m factorial times x to the m. So the log of one minus x, when you expand things out, you get negative x minus x squared over two minus x cubed over three, dot, 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 dot. It's approximately negative x. So if x is really small, x squared is much, much smaller. Just like if x is really, if x is really large, x is much, much smaller than x squared. So to first order, I can basically just say the log of one minus x is approximately negative x. And what we're really doing here is if I give you a function, we're basically saying that near a point, a nice differentiable function is well approximated by its tangent line. That you know, linear approximation does a pretty good job. A quadratic would do an even better job. So if you wanted to, we could actually replace the approximation of negative x with negative x squared over two. And as a nice exercise, you can try to do that and see, does it make much of a difference? 
And you know, given the fact that we're only trying to find n as an integer, the additional gain is just not worth it. So there's a lot of things in life where the amount of extra work you do is not necessarily equal to the gain you get from doing that extra work. I, is everybody comfortable with approximations like this using you know, Taylor series? And we're just going to replace this function. So if you are a little bit uncomfortable, you know, ask me. We can talk about this on Wednesday. You can also just start taking derivatives of the log of 1 minus x. Isn't uh, the power series of 1 over 1, uh, 1 over 1 minus x, 1 plus x squared plus 1 plus x plus x squared? Um, the other sign. Um, um, like, like power series well, well, let's see. So we would have f of x is the log of 1 over x, then f prime of x is going to be 1 over 1 minus x. Then we take the derivative and we get a negative 1. So we get f prime oh. of 0 okay. is going to be um, negative 1. And then when you take the next derivative, you're always going to get two negative signs. One negative sign from the exponent of one minus x. It's one minus x to the negative one, negative two, negative three. And then you're going to get another negative sign because of the uh, chain rule. You have a one minus x. So you get a negative sign there. Okay. Yep. Okay. The other thing is, of course, you should always ask, is this reasonable? So. If x is small and positive, we get the log of 1 minus x is approximately negative x, which is negative. Well, that makes sense because the log of 1 is 0. If you take the log of something a little bit more than 1, it should be positive. If you take the log of something a little bit less than 1, it should be negative. So this at least passes the smell test. It doesn't mean I've made a mistake. And then you could look at what would happen if x was a small negative number. Now we'd be getting a log of one plus a little bit. Okay, so this is reasonable. All right, so if we continue, we now have our Taylor series and we now have the log of one half is approximately the sum, k goes from zero to n minus one of negative k over 365. Using the log of one minus x, is approximately negative x. I, when you see negative k over 365, it's screaming at you, pull out the negative 1 over 365. What is the log of 1 half? That's just negative log 2. Right? So I really have a, a negative sign on both. So the negative signs cancel, so I get 365 log 2 equals the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of k. So this is an extremely famous problem. You know, what is the sum of the first so many consecutive integers? How many of you have seen proofs by induction? So if you've seen proofs by induction, this is screaming at you, do it by induction. So one approach is use induction. There's another approach, divine inspiration. It is n minus 1 times n minus 1 plus 1 over 2. How do you get this? Well, consider, and this is you know, Gauss's trick. Let's let s of m be 1 plus 2 all the way up to m. So we'll do the sum of the first m integers. What Gauss did is he wrote it backwards. And the story is he was doing this in school when he was five years old. And the teacher was just having one of those days and couldn't deal with the graphs and just gave them, you know, add up the numbers from one to 100. I was just looking forward to a couple of minutes of relaxation until Gauss yells out 50 50. And so if we add them like this, we get twice the sum is equal to m plus 1 plus m plus 1 plus m plus 1. And we have this how many times? m times. 
So this is just going to be m times m plus one. So SM is going to just be m m plus one over two. And so there's a really nice quick way of proving what the sum of the first integers are. The problem with this proof, you know, is if I gave you, you know, adding the squares, it wouldn't work. You know, one squared plus m squared is not the same as two squared plus m minus one squared. But you could try to see, could you make that trick work? So as a nice exercise, see if you can use your knowledge of this to figure out the sums of the squares. And then if that works, what would you try to do next? Generalize it. So I'll make that extra credit. So see if you can generalize this and get a formula for sums of your know, higher powers by using this knowledge. What is wonderful about this is we don't need to know the formula that we are using induction. So if you know induction, induction is a lot easier if I tell you, try to prove this. In the real world, they often don't tell you what you have to try to prove. You have to figure that out. A lot of times you can gather data and have a sense of what the answer might be. And so we will talk about that throughout the semester, how to use data to inform us on what the answer might be. But anyways, we now have a formula for the sum of the first m integers. So we can use that. And so we get 365 log two is approximately equal to the sum k goes from zero to n minus one of k, which is equal to n minus one times n over two. So n, n minus one is approximately equal to 365 times the log of four. And we will see later why I want to write it as the log of four. So it's fascinating. On my computer, I can actually see the little mouse owl, but the mouse owl is not projected. I have no idea why that is the case, but it's only distracting me. So All right, any questions as to how we got here? How do we solve this equation for n? So how can we find out? What could we do? Do we just give up in frustration because we've got this terrible equation? I know, is this not a bad equation? Okay, or well, what, what method would you use? It's the... What, what's it called? The, the quadratic equation, quadratic formula. Use the quadratic formula. If we have ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Are you looking forward to squaring things like 365 log of four? No. Or multiplying that by other things and taking squares. But you can just shove this in, right? It's not horrible to use the quadratic formula and find this. And you can approximate the square roots without too much trouble. There is a generalization of the quadratic formula for cubics. There is a generalization for cortex. But for a general degree five and higher, there is no solution. All right, there's another idea. Estimate. So n times n minus one is approximately n um, minus one half times n minus a half. And if you think about what's going on, here's n minus one, here's n, here's n minus a half. And if I look at the difference, the difference is only gonna be one four. So this is a really good approximation. And so you would then get n minus one half squared is approximately 365 log of four. So n minus one half is approximately the square root of 365 log four. So n is approximately one half plus the square root of 365 log four. And so without having to do any of the painful stuff from the quadratic formula, given that I'm already making so many estimations, replacing, you know, n times n minus one with n minus one half squared is not bad. It's going to be pretty good. 
And then the last thing I just want to say about this problem is what if we have D days in a year? So this is this is really our n star. Anybody want to guess what the answer would be if we had D days in a year? Yep. Perfect. And now you can see why I wanted to write things the way I did. Yeah, this is the advantage of having taught this class so many times over the years. You know, I know I'm going to be getting to this equation. So I don't want to combine the two with the 365. I want to keep the two with the log two. So I can quickly look at this and see the answer. All right, so this is one of my favorite problems. Why is this such a great problem? We get to use calculus. So you actually see that, you know, it was worthwhile taking those classes. You know, the idea of the tangent line, tail series expansion, these are useful. We also see that for a lot of problems, you don't have to be exact. Approximations are good enough. And you can estimate it. I think this comes out to and is around 22 uh, in terms of how many people you need. So with the number of people in this room, uh, if there's time after class, I will stop the recording so that people's birthdays not being saved. And we can see if we have enough people to have this work. It also gives us the idea that if you have an event, sometimes it's easier to calculate the probability that something doesn't happen than to calculate the problem that something does happen. I could have three people share the same birthday. I could have four sets of twos. I could have a triple and a quadruple. There are so many different ways for there to be at least two people sharing a birthday. It's much easier to calculate the probability it doesn't happen than to calculate the probability it does happen. We also get you know, beautiful things like you know, formulas for you know, the sums of the integers. And you can see that some of these pure math results are now actually going to be very useful for studying problems. And then the last is you know, parameter dependence. When you can get explicit closed form solutions like this, ah, I can now tell you what happens if we move to Pluto. And you know, there's roughly you know, 90,000 people. You know, how many people would you need? And then of course, as remarked, the answer is going to depend on the assumptions you make. And so if we were talking about a sports team, I would not expect to need as many people. All right. Any questions on the birthday problem before we move to combinatorics? Okay, so let's shift gears. Combinatorics. So you should have all seen this before, but it's not bad to review. So the first is the factorial function. So n factorial is n, n minus one, all the way down to one. It's the number of arrangements when order matters. So you should think the executive committee of an organization, the president is different than the vice president is different than the treasurer is different than the secretary. So one thing we have to be careful about is what is zero factorial? One. Why is zero factorial one? So one is that it's convenient. Yes. If you, so if you're working your way down, right? So the difference between three factorial and two factorial is that three factorial is four by three. Right. So if you divide by two and divide by one, because you, you know one factorial is one. So okay. One one. Good. Using n factorial is n times n minus one factorial. If we do that, since one factorial is one, it suggests that n minus one factorial should be one as well. Good. There's one per one permutation of the null set. So essentially, uh, any Seinfeld fans here? The show about nothing? There's one way to do nothing. You, know, you can't talk about, I have five different ways of doing nothing. No, you can't do nothing five different ways. There's one way to do nothing. There's one way to order nothing. Now, it turns out you can generalize the factorial function, and we will later this semester, to all real numbers, in fact, even all complex numbers. And this idea, this functional equation, uh, is going to be extremely important. So what if I want to choose you know, three from seven order matters? What would the answer be? Yes. 
So I'm going to get there in a long way, but yes. So it's seven times six times five. And then what we do is we multiply by one. And we multiply by one as four factorial over four factorial. And the reason we do this is when you see seven times six times five, it's screaming at you, I want to be a factorial. Look at how close I am. Can you complete me? Now, are you allowed to just multiply the numerator by four factorial? Can we do that? No, you can't just multiply part of an equation, but I can multiply by one. So if I multiply by four factorial over four factorial, I haven't changed the value, but I now have it in a far more useful manner. This is now seven factorial over four factorial. And I believe you might've seen on your calculators or in school, the notation, you know, seven P four. The next is we want to choose three from seven order doesn't matter. And that would be seven P four over three factorial. And the way to think about this is, you know, I first choose when order matters. And there's seven P four ways to choose when order matters. But notice for any three people, how many ways can I permute three people? Three factorial. There are three factorial ways to order three people. So if I look at three people, how many orderings do those three people generate? They generate six or three factorial. And this is why I have to take the number of answers I have when order matters and divide by six or three factorial because any group of three is going to generate six when we count order. So this becomes seven factorial over three factorial, four factorial. And we write this sometimes as, um, as 7C4, I'm oh, sorry, 7C3. Uh, this is not a good choice. Seven choose three. And so these are called the binomial coefficients. No, because we're dividing by, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's been so long since I've done this notation. Um, yeah, you, you, you're right. I, I think that is, um, yes, I think you are right that that is three, not four. Thank you. And then this one should also be, thank you, yes. We very really use the seven P3 notation. Um, so the binomial coefficient um, n choose k is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. And this is the number of ways to choose k objects from n when order does not matter. Okay. At the start of the day, I just had a picture of the sneeches. I put the sneeches back here. Anybody familiar with the Dr. Seuss story of the sneeches? How many types of sneeches are there? At the beginning. At the beginning and at the end, two. there are two types of sneeches those with stars on their bellies and those that do not have stars on their bellies. And we learn at the end of the day, after much money was spent, that it doesn't really matter if you have a star on your belly or not. We can actually use the sneeches to prove theorems and probability. All right. I'm sure this is what everybody did when they were reading Dr. Seuss. All right, so theorem. N choose K equals N choose N minus K. So proof. Brute force algebra. You know, we know what N choose K is. Just multiply everything out and show that they're the same. And so I'll leave that for you to do. But a better way of doing this is proof by story. And this is one of my favorite methods of proof is to tell a story. 
if I have a group of n people and I choose exactly k to be in the group, that's a nice positive way to view things, right? I'm choosing k people to give something to. What is the more negative way to view things? I'm choosing k people to exclude from the group. I'm sorry, no, not k people to exclude from the group. I'm choosing how many people to exclude from the group. It would be, so choosing k is the same as excluding n minus k. And so you can use this observation to prove many, many things. Uh, one of my favorite identities is Pascal. Uh, n plus one choose k plus one equals n choose k plus n choose k plus one. Can somebody give me an outstanding college? Williams. Williams. So we have n students from Williams. Can somebody give me a school that is not quite as good as Williams, a school that might have issues with, oh, I don't know, following the rules in Nest Tech Sports? Amherst. And we unfortunately have one student from Amherst with us. And we want K plus one people. How many ways can we get K plus one people from a group of N plus one people? It's just, I have n plus one people, I need to choose k plus one. Now, I can view it, however, as another way. I could be in the situation where unfortunately we did choose that student from Amherst. Or I could be in the situation where I don't have the student from Amherst. Those are the two cases. And if I count how many ways there are to do each one and add them together, I'm done. If I choose the student from Amherst, how many more students do I need? Not M. I'm, I'm trying to get K plus one students total. So how many students do I need? I need K. So I have to choose K Williams students. And if I don't choose the Williams, I'm oh, sorry, if I don't choose the Amherst student, how many students do I need to choose from Williams? K plus one. And what I like about this is if you look at it, the tops always add up to n plus one, the bottoms always add up to k plus one. This is a nice way of viewing Pascal's triangle. How many of you have seen this relation before? How come we don't put in one choose one and one choose zero? Why didn't you ever learn it that way? There's gotta be a reason. Probably related to like, like, um, like maybe a generating function with the binomial coefficients as coefficients. Yeah, like but but why, but why when you learn this formula, then they put one choose one and one choose zero? Here with three terms. So, okay. But can I just drop terms in a formula? Ah, if they're equal to one, right? Why would I bother putting in a one there? Hopefully this gives you some sense of why Pascal's triangle is true. Because there's a real story going on here. And sometimes when you compress things, the story becomes a little bit harder to follow. So I have degrees in math and physics, and there's something called the rationalized MKS units. Where, what would you guess the speed of light would be in the rationalized units? One. And the gravitational constant? Nope. One. You basically said as many things as possible to one. Now, at some point, things start to mesh with each other. And you can't have everything equal one. Uh, what would be the charge of an electron? I think that's also one. You, know, you make everything one as possible. When you do this, and I see the equations, the equations are a little bit easier that you don't have all this you know, gunk floating around. But I lose my intuition in terms of what am I looking at? And you know, to me, with my physics background, it's a little bit easier when I have the equations and I can just see what's going on. So we'll do more proofs by story. It's an extremely powerful technique. Uh, a lot of combinatorics is based on this is, can I take an expression which is really hard and show that it's equivalent to something which hopefully is a little bit easier for me to calculate. All right, so we have about five, six minutes left. I wanna talk about 
institutionalizing and good choices. Um, I've got it's 944. I'm just making sure because I hear people outside. Is that roughly the time everybody has? Yeah. Okay. So who knows what QWERTY is? It's the keyboard. It is basically proof that your parents don't love you and that you will not love your own children. Why is the keyboard structured this way? And please don't call me out of context. Yes? Uh, it's, slow down your it's to slow down your typing. In the old days of typewriters, when you had the physical things flying down and making marks on paper, if you hit two letters that were close to each other in quick succession, they would come down and lock. So they designed the keyboard to slow down your typing. Does it make any sense to be doing that today? No. Why are we still doing it? Because we don't love you enough to change. If anybody wants to start a movement to abolish QWERTY, I'm happy to join you. But these things get institutionalized. One of my favorite moments when I was a grad student at Princeton is, you know, I was teaching multivariate calculus one year. And at the end, I asked the students, so how many of you like the problems where we had two cylinders intersecting at right angles and you had to find the volume of the region of intersection? Oh, okay, so no one liked it. Okay, should we remove those problems from the course for next year? Oh, no, no, no. Well, why not? And what do you think they said? We suffered. We suffered. Yeah. And what do you think I said? But then suffered. No. <laughs> That's what they said last year. <laughs> and the year before, and the year before, and you're, the chain never breaks. So really think hard. Decisions get institutionalized. Uh, sometimes people make good choices. So I want to talk very briefly about Babylonian mathematics. Anybody know what base the Babylonians used? Four. Not 64. Four. Close, close to 64. 60. They used base 60. You know, we have 360 degrees in a circle. This, you know, well, this goes back to the Babylonians. A year is actually almost uh, 60 uh, times six, which is interesting. Now, why did they like 60? Well, when you don't have calculus and whatnot, 60 is a highly composite number. When you look at all the ways you can split 60 evenly, there's a lot of choices. So 60 is really good. But when you think about multiplication tables, you know, base 10, you have approximately one half 10 times 10 is approximately 50 things to remember. It's not quite that because of the diagonal, but you know, since x times y is y times x, you have approximately 50 things to remember. Base 60, dear Lord, you would have approximately one half 60 times 60, which is 1800. So you have to memorize 1800. Not happening. So what you would often do is you would have tablets. This is one of the earliest things of a lookup table. You do the calculation once, and now you have it readily available. But the Babylonians were clever. And the way they would multiply x times y is they would do x plus y squared. They would subtract x minus y squared, and they would divide by 4. At first sight, it is tough to see something that looks more foolish than this. So rather than multiplying two numbers, I'm going to do two subtractions in addition, a division by four, and two squarings. It turns out that is actually an improvement. Why is this better? Yeah. Only need to know the squares. So that's maybe 60 or 120 items. You know, to have a similar range. Yeah. They were not looking at tremendously large numbers back then. We still use stuff like this. If you're taking advanced mathematics with quadratic forms and you're doing stuff like this, this is actually a really good way to work with a lot of things. There's other versions of this you could do. You could do x plus y squared minus x squared minus y squared over 2. Yeah. That's another way to do it. 
So the point of all of this is to just really think before you start doing any calculations, especially if this is something that's gonna be done many, many times. If it's only gonna be done once or twice, it doesn't really matter too much how you choose to do it. But if it's gonna be done time and time again, really think about it. Was QWERTY a good decision? At the time, was it? Yes, it solved the problem it needed to solve. But just because something worked in the past does not mean it is necessarily the right thing to be doing now as we have you know, more technology and new things. So really think about things, really constantly revisit. All right, so we're gonna stop here for today.